Well, hello, everybody. Uh, <laughs> Before I begin, I just want to say thanks to everybody who helped put on Closure West. Uh, I very much enjoy giving talks at Closure West because they tend to be sort of more user focused, you know, more us focused, more technical, less brain thoughty. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for uh, jumping on this side of the wall. I appreciate that. Uh, this talk is called Faster Delivery with Pedestal and Vase. The font size is important here because the talk really is about faster delivery. I mean, that's the primary focus of this talk. And we could sort of talk a lot about, you know, why would I choose to talk about faster delivery? And maybe we would tease these words apart. What do I mean by faster? You know, how does faster relate to innovation? How does faster relate to competitive advantage and so on? Or, you know, what do I really mean by delivery and how is delivery related to value and why is that particularly important? And, you know, there's some special purpose why I want to put these two words next to each other. That would be a very typical thing for me to do at this point in the talk. Um, but I think this quote says it best. Sustainable competitive advantage has to be won by creating the internal capacity to improve and innovate fast and without let up. The constant evolution of technology has a direct impact on business. Innovate and deliver value or be left behind. And when we're looking at the winners, the best companies, the best organizations, the best projects, one thing sort of stands out here. They seem to know before everybody else. They seem to learn faster. They have that answer before anybody else saw it. And once they have that answer in hand, they, they adapt faster and they deliver value faster. So how is that possible? Now, how can I get that superpower? How can I be a, you know, the winning team or whatever? And I think there's one aspect of this that is related to the reason why we're all here today. And, uh, you know, there's a reason why we choose Clojure. It's this programming language designed to solve the problems that we face today on, you know, these modern systems with modern demands on modern infrastructure. You know, that's why we picked up Clojure. And maybe with Clojure, we really are more efficient. Maybe we really can do more with less. We use that phrase a lot as we're trying to sell Clojure to other people. Oh, I can do way more with less with Clojure. And that's somehow better. But we should be very careful about this phrase, do more with less. Because there's something hidden underneath here. And the thing that's hidden, I think, is particularly more important than doing more with less. What we're really saying is that incidental complexity in all of its forms costs us time. And that's time that we could be spent, you know, we could spend learning or adapting or delivering value. Critical time. So incidental complexity gets in the way of winning. It is the enemy of delivering value. And, and, and so I think that's what closure is really giving us, a way to combat that enemy, to deliver value faster. And sure, there are many aspects at play here. I'm not pretending like, you know, closure is the thing that solves all of these problems. You know, there's social aspects and cultural aspects and so on. But I'm interested in one particular aspect. Sharp tools that are data-driven that enable delivery. That's what I want to talk about. So today we're going to talk about two tools designed to help you deliver faster, basically designed to give you that competitive edge. The two tools are Pedestal and Vase. Pedestal is a set of data-centric libraries for back-end and enterprise systems. It's a general purpose interceptor system that's fast, secure, robust, and built on well-established practices. We'll tease apart each of those bullets over the next couple of slides. And then we'll talk about Vase, data-described microservices that sit on top of on Pedestal. Inter the interesting aspect there is that they're declarative. Vase does all sort of the hard, mundane work for you. And they're fully extensible, allowing you to move that tool to wherever you need to. It moves development time of services from days and weeks to just minutes. And we'll see how that's possible as we develop a service. And I have some goals in talking about these two tools specifically. Not just that I work on them, but you know, I want to I want to spread some information. I think there's a misconception across the community at large about what Pedestal really is, about what it provides you, about what you can do with it. And I want to help you all see Pedestal the way that I see Pedestal. And we're going to do that by looking only at the fundamentals. 
We're just going to look at the very bottom layer, way down deep in Pedestal. And from there, you'll sort of understand Pedestal the way that I see it. And after that, we'll talk about Vase. We'll sort of talk about the motivation. If I have Pedestal and Pedestal's so great, why would I ever need Vase? Well, there's a very specific reason for that. And after that, we'll do a tutorial building services with Vase. And before I go any further, Pedestal has a new website, pedestal.io. You can find all sorts of things on it, guides, samples, API docs, reference docs. Everything has sort of been collected from all around the internet and put into the one site. And thank you to everybody in the Pedestal community who has helped contribute to the site. It's been a huge success. So, you know, Pedestal is this set of libraries for backend development. That's something a lot of us do. And it provides a foundation for building robust enterprise services, usually HTTP services. I mean, I think typically that's the kind of services that we write, something with HTTP. But Pedestal isn't actually tied to HTTP at all. In fact, really nothing in Pedestal except for one small section is HTTP specific. So you can extend Pedestal well beyond just these HTTP services to other application protocols or services like Kafka or 9P. We've done both. And you can also extend it to other transports like SCTP, Reliable UDP, and UDT. We've done all of those as well. Pedestal is sort of built on these core ideas. And so when I think of Pedestal, I, I usually start at these core ideas. Everything in Pedestal is an interceptor. Interceptors are just data structures, and interceptors compose. So once you understand an interceptor, the rest of Pedestal sort of falls into place. We like to say, all the context is in the context. Each of these interceptors take a context as an argument. That's the only argument they take. And they all return a context. The context is just a map. And so everything that controls Pedestal, all of the functionality of Pedestal that makes Pedestal seem special, it's actually just values inside of that map. Everything is controlled from that context map. Everything in Pedestal, absolutely everything, is programmed to an interface. So you can extend Pedestal to whatever you need, whatever services you need, whatever data structures you need, whatever. And in Pedestal, we favor data over functions, and we favor functions over macros. And so people compare Pedestal and Ring quite often. But I don't think that comparison is particularly useful for Pedestal or for Ring. You know, Pedestal is this generic general purpose interceptor system. We just also happen to ship a lot of interceptors that are related to HTTP services as part of one library called Pedestal Service. And let me tell you, interceptors are absolutely everywhere. There's a volume of books called Pattern-Oriented Software Architecture. And interceptors have dedicated chapters in volume two, concurrent computing patterns, and in volume four, distributed computing patterns. And throughout all the other chapters, they all reference back to interceptors because of their composability. The servlet, uh, Java servlets, and specifically the servlet filter, is actually just the interceptor pattern, just one implementation written in Java. And nearly all message-oriented middleware are written using the interceptor pattern, specifically for the reasons cited in those two books. Computational pipelines, usually some form of a computational DAG, oftentimes implemented as an interceptor chain. And so Pedestal is just an implementation of this pattern, of the interceptor pattern, and more specifically, the combination of chain of responsibility and the interceptor pattern. So let's just dive in. I think all of these concepts make more sense when you see the pieces come together. And we'll start with interceptors. Interceptors are the building block of Pedestal. You can think of them as a little Lego all by itself there. And they're a map. You know, they're map-like. So they optionally have a name that's usually a namespaced keyword. And they have at least one of enter, leave, and error. And those are all functions that take a context and return a context. If some data flows into an interceptor, you would call the enter function. If some response was coming out of the interceptor, you would call the leave function. And if you wanted to handle any errors, you would call the error function. The creation of interceptors is controlled by the interceptor API, no surprise. But very specifically, the into interceptor protocol. Anything that fulfills that protocol can be an interceptor inside of Pedestal. All right, so here we have a, a single interceptor. It's just this little Lego block. It has this name. It has an enter function that takes a context and returns a context. 
And just like a single Lego block, it's not very fun to play with. You know, you just maybe put it in your hand and admire it, but that's about as much as you can do with it, so it needs some friends. And we want to stick all these Lego blocks together. And in Pedestal, when you stick those Lego blocks together, we call that the interceptor chain. The interceptor chain is just about uh, building and executing collections of interceptors together. So you can imagine, you know, each interceptor does exactly one job. I want to compose all those jobs or capabilities together. And so we get this interceptor chain. And we call it the interceptor chain because it is the interceptor pattern and the chain of responsibility pattern. If one interceptor doesn't do the job, you go to the next interceptor and so on. Once you get to the end of the chain, you can also flow back and handle the leave stage of each interceptor. So a few slides back, I said the context controls the pedestal. So let's talk about what kinds of control actually exist inside of that context. This chain, the chain itself, all of the interceptors that need to execute, that's a value inside of the context. So let's just take some time and wrap our brain around that. An interceptor gets a context that has the chain of all the interceptors that should execute, which means any interceptor could add more interceptors to execute, remove all of the interceptors to execute, dynamically change or reorder those interceptors that are to execute. So every interceptor has full control over the system inside of Pedestal. But we do this sort of thing all the time. Think about an HTTP router. A router in a sort of a naive case would look at an HTTP method and a URL and decide, can I handle that request or not? And if it could handle that request, maybe it just queues up all of the interceptors needed to handle that request. So a router is a really good example of a single interceptor that adds more interceptors after it. Terminating the chain is also inside of the uh, context. There's a sequence of functions, predicate functions, and if any of them return true, execution stops. And so if you want to decide how, a, how an interceptor chain should execute or stop, or you can go ahead and do that as well. And Pedestal is maybe most known for its async capabilities, going async. You know, it gets talked about a lot on the web. Well, going async inside of Pedestal is just a value inside of the context map. It's just a function that talks about how you go async on any given platform for that chain. So there's nothing special in Pedestal that makes it async capability, except that we chose a design pattern specifically for concurrent and distributed computing. That also means that you can define async capabilities for whatever platform you want. Right, you can write an interceptor chain that runs on servlets or runs against HTTP and turn around and run that exact same chain on Kafka or something else. And all the signaling between interceptors and the signaling that interceptors make to the platform they're sitting on, all of those keys and values, those are also in the context. So absolutely everything is in the context. The context is in the context. All right, so we've got this chain of interceptors. This is cool. We, we've composed all this functionality together. Awesome. I, you know, my job is pretty simple, especially if other people have written interceptors. Except this is sort of like in a silo, right? It's in this vacuum. It's doing all this work, but like, where is it doing this work? And so we need some way to connect an interceptor chain to a platform, and we call that a chain provider. That's pretty much all it does, right? The chain provider just connects a chain to a given platform and supplies the initial context. And the initial context has you know, the default interceptors that always need to execute, the terminators that should exist for this platform. It usually defines the function, you know, how do I go async? You know, there's a key inside the context map called async fun. Maybe it, maybe it defines that. Maybe async works on your platform, maybe it doesn't. So it's got to define that. And then any sort of platform-specific interceptors you want. So how do I turn closure data structures into bytes on the wire for my given application protocol? protocol? One example of this is the servlet chain provider. That's the default one in Pedestal. You know, so I want to run some Pedestal chain on the servlet, and I want to use all capabilities of the platform I want, all async capabilities, all signaling capabilities. You know, I want zero copy requests going through my chain. That's the default in Pedestal. Always use the platform for whatever the platform provides you with. And when I think of Pedestal, this is what I think of. Composing interceptors helps me get to a deliver deliverable result faster. You know, I don't have to do as much work. All of the hard work of connecting functionalities together, connecting to a platform, that's all managed for me. I just have to put my business logic into incremental steps inside of these interceptors. 
Well, Pedestal ships with a set of modules built to build systems. I mean, it really is a set of libraries for building these robust enterprise uh, systems and services. And so we've really just been talking about Pedestal.Interceptor, the module that has the Interceptor API and all the things for running an Interceptor chain. Well, Pedestal also has a separate module called Pedestal Route. And you could use Pedestal Route for any kind of generic routing. So think about all the different kinds of routing, right? We have routing for web services. We have routing for queues. We have all sorts of different kinds of routing, you know? And Pedestal ships with this Pedestal Route for very efficient um, uh, routing that, in the most optimal case, does constant time routing, and in the general case, does logarithmic routing. On my laptop that I'm presenting on right now, Pedestal can make a routing decision and apply all routing constraints in under 60 nanoseconds. So it's, it's extremely fast. So I would say, you know, I did all this hard work to write this really efficient router. Just don't, just don't write linear routers. Just go out and use really efficient routers. Pedestal log is also efficient logging, but also includes runtime and operational metrics. So you want to keep track of these distributions of events that happen over your system. That's how we build robust systems. We want to understand the distribution of behaviors that exist. And Pedestal ships with this capability automatically, but you can extend it into your application. And the metrics recording can be published to sort of any metrics recorder that you want. So by default, it publishes to JMX, but you could also publi uh, publish the metrics to CloudWatch or to StatsD or to any other metrics record recording capability that you would like. <clears throat> And then lastly, we have Pedestal Service. This is just the collection of HTTP-specific interceptors. So you know, this is sort of the whole picture of what Pedestal is, is giving you. And this is good, but honestly, it's not good enough. Innovate and deliver value or be left behind. And in this pursuit, we need to be anti-fragile. In the world of ephemeral computing, microservices, and constant change, we really need our code to be a disposable inventory. We can't become attached to our systems. The reality is they're either going to be superseded or they're going to become irrelevant. So when you're faced with this, what do you do? My colleague Michael Nygaard has written extensively about this in a series of articles titled The New Normal. I highly recommend you read them, but that would be a whole separate talk by itself. So businesses change, customers change, technologies evolve. And we need to minimize risk in this world by maximizing change. We need to play to the same thing that we're scared of. But let's just take a step back. You know, our tools can help us here. We can make our tools do all of the hard work for us. But we have to think about what do our tools do well, and how can we orient that towards this problem? I want to maximize value, and maximize change in order to minimize risk. Well, the tool set that we have in Clojure is really great at taking in data, reshaping data, doing something with it, and returning some sort of a result. So if we can turn our problem into a data problem, our tool set will work for us. It will do all the heavy lifting for us. And that's exactly what Vase does. It takes the creation of services, all the things that go along with writing services, plugging pieces together, and it turns it into a data problem. It's a library for writing declarative, data-driven microservices. It comes with database integration and data validation. All of the mundane data, data plumbing is already taken care of for you in base. Request tagging, uniform response shaping, data encoding, all of the mundane stuff that goes into creating a service that's a good citizen, that does the things you want it to do, that has all the extra bells and whistles. Yeah, Vase does that for you. You shouldn't have to keep doing that. You shouldn't have to plug those pieces together. <clears throat> it's fully extensible in, in many aspects. We'll, we'll see that in a couple of slides here. It's been in development since 2014, but very recently open sourced. And we could keep talking about Vase's attributes. I mean, that's kind of fun to do. Um, but most of those details can be found out on the web or in other talks or in a blog post. Instead, I think we should just create a service and see it in action. So we're going to do a snapshot version of that. And I think, you know, why not build a blog service? That's what everybody does here, right? So 
let's not stray too far from the mainstream. We want people to take closure seriously. And if we want them to take it seriously, well, hell, we need a blog service. So here we go. It's going to be a micro blog service because a full blog service is too involved. And plus, you know, micro blogs probably sell better, I guess, on the internet. So Vase ships with a template that works both in Linegan and in Boot. Here we're going to start with Linegan. And we're going to do a line new Vase blogging. This creates a fully working service for us with all of the best production settings offered by Pedestal. All we need to do is write the service descriptor. So we need to describe our service in some form of data. And the first thing that we probably should do is talk about our data model, our domain. You know, what is it that we're actually working with? In Vase, we use these things called Vase norms. They're just chunks of schema, logically grouped by your data model. So our data model has some notion of users. And in fact, now we can see the data model for users. You know, a user has a username that's a single string. And that's how we're going to identify our users. And users also have emails that are also a single string. And the other part of our, our service, you know, it has blogs. And blogs have titles that are strings, and you know, content that is strings, and an author. And an author is a reference back to one of our users. Now, you'll notice here that I made title unique. You know, we're going to identify all of our blog posts by their title. So that makes sure that people don't keep repeating the same nonsense over and over and over and over again. It also means that you know, just like you, know, you, you hammer out those fast emails that are just the subject line and then end of message with no body, you know, I want to be able to write a blog service that's like that. That's like, here's the title of my blog. Imagine the content. Enjoy. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to build this, this service right here. All right, so we've got our data model. That's really good. But now we need some data validation. And in Vase, data validation is done using Closure Spec. And anything that you can do in Closure Spec, you can do for data validation in Vase. And you're allowed to use the data validation at any point in your service. So you're going to see that we're going to use it a couple of times. So here I'm just saying, you know, what do I expect usernames to be? What do I expect user emails to be? And so on. You know, what does good data look like for my system? I want to make sure that only good data gets into my system. And how do I shape data when it's going out of my system to make sure that you know, it fulfills all the properties I expect it to fulfill? My favorite line in this slide is uh, the second from the bottom. When I start to define blogs, I get this great line of bloggy blog blog, uh, which you know, always brings a smile to my face, bloggy blog blog. OK, so you know, I've got some data validation. I can see how this might shape the rules around my data. But now I actually have to do some work. I need HTTP API endpoints, transactions, queries, validations. I need my service to come to life. I need it to do something useful. So Vase has namespaced API chunks. And here I'm uh, underneath the, the namespace bloggy v1. But it could be any namespace. It doesn't really matter. And then I define all of the routes for my service. This is where I'm going to let all of my tools do the work for me. I'm going to describe my service in data by talking about sort of the, the, the main action. And then Vase will go ahead and expand that into all of the functionality and connect it the correct way. So if I make a get request to slash blog, it's going to perform a query. And that query has an optional parameter called selector. And I want to make sure that selector comes in as closure data. I don't want it to come in as a string. I want to treat it like data, so I'm going to coerce it into Eden. And then I'm just going to run a query against the Datomic DB that's sitting underneath my service. All of those details, Vase will figure out. Now, this parameterized selector is pretty cool. It lets people say exactly how they want their data. Let's see what really happens when we start calling this. So if I call just slash blog, so there's the namespace. If I call just slash blog, the default selector gives me all the fields of a blog post and then also unpacks all of the fields of the reference to the user. I get everything. But maybe I don't need all of that. You know, maybe I'm just writing some search result page where you see all the blog titles. And so Vase allows you to write very quickly demand-driven APIs, where by call, you get to shape your data however you need. So here I've said, well, for my selector, I actually just need blog titles, and all I get back are blog titles. All right, let's keep going. Let's look at the post operation for slash blog. So if you call post on slash blog, you're going to see we're going to do a couple of steps. And these steps, we actually call those action literals inside of Vase. Those are the actions that you can do. That's, those are the actions uh, 
that Vase understands. But you could extend those, right? They're just reader literals, and you could write your own reader literals and give Vase new capabilities. Underneath all of these action literals are interceptors. And so think back to that interceptor chain where we saw each block being composed together. You can actually see each block being composed together here inside of that vector. So you can see how the pieces are being added together. First, we're going to validate some data. And validation inside of VASE is pretty simple. You want to apply some spec to some path in the request. I want to ensure that my request is shaped the way that I expect it to be shaped. Pretty cool. If the validation fails, you get back an error result. If it passes, you keep going to the next interceptor. The next interceptor is just this generic interceptor. And it's just going to reshape the data, specifically ensuring that the author is a lookup ref inside of Datomic. So we're just going to change the shape a little bit. And then we're going to perform this transaction. And transactions just look at data payloads given a whitelist, and then they'll transact those attributes into the DB. So pretty straightforward there, too. But think about the services that you write and how much code and how many functions are involved in doing all of these things. Grabbing a request, unpacking a request, looking at fields, validation, data shaping, request tagging, shaping the data one more time, doing a transaction, ensuring I have a connection to the DB, all of that. So Vase is going to handle all of those details for me. OK, but let's not forget our users. We also have users. They're very important. Here we are, slash user. If I make a get request, it's going to perform a query on my DB looking up my username. If I make a post, I'll create some more users in my system. And if I make an HTTP delete, I'll delete some users in my system. Pretty quick. Think about you know, you're in a meeting. In that meeting, you're discussing the data model. You're hammering out that data model as a, as a descriptor here. You know, OK, well, yeah, we have users. We have all this stuff. And now I can just hammer out these actions pretty quickly. And that's it. Let's just take all of those pieces, we'll shove them into a single file, and we're done. We have a service. And we started with our, our vase norms, our data model. So here we are in a meeting. You know, it's a pretty big meeting. I mean, if we add up all of the dollars this is costing us right now, it's pretty impressive. All right, and you're telling me about your problem, your, your, your domain, and I'm capturing that domain. All right, yeah, users have a username, users have an email, all right. OK, so we got our data model. And then you start telling me about these business rules. All right, I'm still typing. You know, I've got, there's a lot of us here, so we could all be typing. OK, so yep, usernames can be non-empty strings. All right, so I'm writing all of these specs pretty quick. And then I sit down, I just, I let Vase do all the hard work for me. All right, so I have some queries. I have some transactions. I got to make sure I only get clean data. Let the tools do the hard work for you. And then at the very end, we have some API settings. Maybe you want to change the data encoding. By default, Vase uh, uses JSON, but you know, maybe you want to use transit, or maybe it's XML, or whatever you want to use. You can set that per API. Now, we wrote this all in one file, but we could actually split all of this up across many files. This is just a data structure. And Vase understands how to merge all of these parts into a single data structure. So write it in a single file, write it in 200 files. It doesn't really matter. It's just data. And we could also have multiple APIs inside of a single descriptor. So we only wrote one service API, but everything was namespaced. So we can go ahead and add as many services in a single descriptor as we want. Maybe there's families of services that are related, and I want them all in one descriptor. I could also write as many services as I want across as many files as I want, and Vase will merge those all together. All of this works with interactive development. As soon as you do a line, new, Vase, whatever, and you fire up a dev server, as you write a descriptor, those changes will appear as soon as you save that descriptor file, which makes it very quick to write a quick query and see if that query returns the data that you expect. You don't have to do all of this data plumbing, get the database together, all that stuff. Just Start up, get a new descriptor, write a query, and see the results. So this is pretty great. I'm feeling pretty good about this right now. But let's just take a step back. Now, why did I really want Vase here when I have Pedestal and I could do whatever I want with Pedestal? Vase enables services to be disposable inventory. In less than five minutes, we just made a blog service. I could easily throw that blog service away and write a new one in another five minutes. 
I'm not attached to it. It can be evolved independently. I could go and evolve the data model in another descriptor if I wanted to and merge that in. So Vase allows these, these, this code, these services, to be disposable inventory. But it's also important to remember what's underneath these, these descriptors. It's sitting on top of pedestal. And that ensures that I can move these services to any platform that I need to. I could always drop down and extend rich functionality through pedestal. That's totally open here. Remember these action literals, those are just interceptors. So anything that you can do in an interceptor, you can do inside of Vase. And we're not done. We've been working on a lot of exciting pieces. So for Pedestal specifically, we've been porting the interceptor chain and the logging and the metrics over to ClojureScript. That's exciting for a couple of different reasons, as it will play out over these next bullet points. Internally at uh, Cognitech, we have Pedestal Kafka, an intercept or a interceptor chain, a chain provider, specifically for connecting Pedestal to Kafka. And we also have Pedestal Views, generic templating that can be parameterized by the template engine. So you know it's not married to any engine. And that's great for the obvious templating case, which is HTML. But it could also template data payloads. So you want to structure all of your data payloads in one very specific way. Well, we have Pedestal Views. And Pedestal Views has an action literal inside of it, which means that inside of my vase descriptors, I can do full data templating as well, whether that's HTML or just payloads. For vase, we've been looking at various descriptor formats. We saw the, sort of the lowest level format you could ever write in, the data itself, the data representation of a service. But you might imagine that you create shorthand descriptors or shorthand formats that do more work for you. You know, for humans that have better error messages or whatever. So we've been exploring that in Vase. We've also been running Vase on AWS Lambda. So this is particularly exciting. You know, imagine that I write a lot of Vase action literals for various services that exist on AWS. All of our programming languages, they've been structured for programming on a single machine. There's threads, there's cores, there's functions. And the moment that you try to go up a level, you know, AWS lambdas, S3, Kinesis, SQS, Qs. OK, well, now that's humans plugging all the parts together. But the lesson here is, you know, let your tools do that hard work for you. And so we've been proving out that with Vase, we can write action literals to allow you to program at a higher level, to effectively create a programming language for the cloud. So that's particularly exciting. And we have Vase Solar, adding another data store beyond Atomic into Vase. Solar is a pretty cool choice. It allows you to do recommendations, free text search, but also things like geospatial indexing. So if you have the data that you know, maybe doesn't fit so well with Datomic or you want to do search or recommendation applications, well, now you can quickly spin these up in Vase as well. And the last piece that we've been exploring is automated simulation testing given the description of a service. So if you start moving into the cloud, if you start building distributed services, you very quickly want to be able to write a test that is the composition of those small services. But there is yet to be a testing tool that very easily allows you to say, I want to test the combination of these 5 or 20 services. That's sort of a tough problem. But when all of your services are described in data, it's very easy to look at that data and come up with the operational space of composing those services together. So we can do this automated simulation testing nearly for free if you write it in a descriptor format. All right, so you know that's a lot. But think about the fundamental pieces. They're just small interceptors, and they can be composed together. So go out, you know, write some interceptors, write some vase literals to make your tools do the hard work for you. But above all, don't waste your time battling incidental complexities. Use Pedestal and Vase and deliver value faster. Thank you very much.